Okay everyone, Mike here from The Art of Guitar. We're finally doing another artist series. It's taken a little bit because I had to order some books. I had to get some new uh, effects, uh, namely this talk box for this one. And now we're going to honor Jerry Cantrell today, one of my heroes. Uh, Alice in Chains was a huge part of my life when I was in my angsty early 20s. And I don't think I could have gotten through it without, without them. Uh, there were a lot of help and comfort at the time, especially the Jar of Flies album. If you guys haven't heard that one, make sure you get that, okay? And I don't have any Alice in Chains uh, shirts, so I just got this Alice in Wonderland shirt that I had laying around. So it's close enough, but uh, not really. Okay, let's get started. We have a lot of techniques to cover. Okay, so we're a half step down, and we're going to go to drop C sharp a couple times. Uh, and there are a couple Alice in Chains tunes that are actually standard tuning, but I'm going to leave it in half step down, just so you know it's not going to match the album exactly, okay? Okay, let's get started. So when I saw Alice in Chains open for... Slayer a long time ago. That was a weird show. Uh, basically, I heard this song live and it just blew me away. And it was this drop D riff that they do. It's pretty heavy. Now what I really like about it is this little bend that they do. So if you want to do drop D bends, it's a really cool way to make your, your sound even heavier. Check this out. So what we're doing in this case is we're just boring across at the 5th fret and we're bending both strings just a little bit to really enhance the heaviness of this riff. Whenever you're in drop D, it's really cool to extend the chords that you play just to make them even heavier. You know, drop D players usually play the fattest strings. But if you want to add some of the higher strings to it, it's a good idea to develop this shape right here. So let's say you're barring across the third fret. Go ahead on the third string in this case, go to the fifth fret, and then the second string, go to your pinky. You get a giant sounding chord. Uh, they use it sort of like in this context here, they go. So I wonder if Jerry got this next technique from Eddie Van Halen, because we cover this in the Van Halen Artist Series. But it's when you walk down a scale, in this case it's mostly going to be a blues scale. And we're going to go ahead and do some uh, staccato, but at the same time artificial harmonics. So it's a little cooler than just going like this. To add a little bit of a squeal to each one. Okay, that was a little bit extreme. Sometimes he won't really do all that. but. That's more like it. If you really want to make that cool too, add the wah pedal. By the way, you guys need a wah pedal if you're going to do Jerry Cantrell techniques, just because he uses one all the time, almost as much as Kirk Hammett. Okay. So when I did the Smells Like Teen Spirit levels, we talked about the Cobain chord. Well, today we're going to have the Cantrell chord. And he actually has two chords, in my opinion. One of them that he claimed right off the bat with the song Man in the Box is going to be this chord. So usually what people do is they play power chords. So they'll play open E and then B in this case. Played it together it would sound like this. Not as evil sounding, but what Jerry Cantrell does, instead of adding the fifth interval, he's gonna go up here and he's going to add the D in this case, which is gonna be your flat seven note. So separately, together. Jerry's really good at trilling. And if you go here to the fifth string and we're gonna go from the fifth fret to the seventh fret and we're just gonna go really fast, it's, it, it's kind of like a, a strength builder if you just do this for a long period of time, maybe you're watching TV or something. Just go ahead and flick your fingers a little bit. Pretty soon over time, you're gonna build up your stamina and uh, hopefully the power in your fingers. So start off slow. And speed up slowly. Now, if you really wanna make it a Jerry Cantrell sound, add a wah pedal and slowly open it up as you do it. So 
So when you do that, you're gonna add extra overtones to it, which just makes it sound that much bigger. He's really good at getting the most out of a single note. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bend the note. In this case, we're gonna bend A, we're gonna be on the third string, 14th fret. Uh, I say A as if we're in standard tuning, but we're a half step down, remember? So we're gonna bend that a whole step, and as it's coming down, we're gonna chop away at it with a pick until it's all the way back down. And as a bonus, we're gonna add the wah pedal once again to really give it that sound. For some reason, when you do the bleeding of the note, doing an upstroke is a good idea. Some, I, I do a lot of downstrokes, but for this I like to do upstrokes because it's kind of easier for me at least to grab the string and mute it afterwards, which is part of the killing of the note. Down you could do it. It just doesn't feel as effective for some reason. Give it a try yourself. Maybe you'll find it's the opposite for you. Adding the wah pedal. Jerry's got a great sense of rhythm, and obviously you can tell that when he plays his rhythms, but also with some of his leads too. So there's a part where he goes like this, and it gets very stratty sounding, but it's... Now, he's adding a bunch of mutes, which gives it sort of that uh, voodoo child kind of sound, you know, like... Um... My secret for doing that, just personally, is I mute the strings and I just sort of play some rhythm. Just like the beginning of Voodoo Child. Okay, but in this case, not going to use the wah, but we're going to go like this. And of course you can't talk about man in the box without talking about the talk box which is what i was waiting for i had to order it so when i finally came in i know i could do this artist series and i was excited but i was a little bit you know perplexed i've used uh the other types of original talk boxes in the past but i've got this uh rocktron version of one it's cool it has a built-in preamp so you don't have to put your amp into it your sound of your amp into it which is great uh, but it took a while to get used to. I'm still working on it. You know, at home, I was just holding the hose in my mouth with my teeth, and it was really strange. But I've got it here uh, hooked up to this microphone, and it's still not exactly right, but uh, you'll, get the, you'll get the idea. The sound feeds through this tube, and then your mouth shapes the sound, so I need the microphone to pick up the sound. It's kind of sweet, huh? If you could just get past the part where you feel really stupid putting a tube in your face, uh, it's actually a really cool effect. Sorry, had to try it. A really cool way to spark a little more excitement in a bend uh, is to actually bend over what you're trying to do. So we're going to do a step and a half bend. He uses this very effectively in a lot of um, situations, but in this case... <laughs> See, now we're blending a couple techniques already. We've got that Van Halen walk down. But listen to if I did this just a whole step. It's not as exciting. But if you were to bend, remember, a whole step is two frets. A step and a half will be three frets distance. So if I'm here on E on the third string uh, ninth fret, i got to bend all the way to the pitch of G. So if you ever think your solos are sounding a little bit flat, go ahead and try to express a little bit more uh, uh, energy with your bends by going a half step, maybe even a whole step over what you were originally trying to do. All right, he does this great open E chord, but he rakes backwards. So raking is a really great way to express a chord in a different way. Because we're so used to just playing that direction. If you can go this direction, and then for a bonus, go close to the bridge. Really sounds interesting, doesn't it? Especially what he does afterwards. That's the grooviest riff I think I've heard in a long time. The beginning of Rain When I Die, he does the behind the nut rake. And uh, we did this in the weird sounds video, but all you gotta do is take your pick Go right behind the nut and just rake across the strings. 
I think I call it Hades Harp. But I added a few effects. We have a delay, we have a reverb and compression and a little bit of chorus. Just sounds really cool. When I was in a teenage metal band, we were setting up at this out of town gig and the sound guy kept playing this weird song over and over again. And I asked him, who is this? And he said, it's the new Alice in Chains. At the time it was brand new when Dirt first came out. And he kept playing this tune. And to this day, it's so perplexing, just the sounds I get out of this. Uh, it's utilizing the flatted five also known as the tritone or the devil's interval because it gets the sound. Goes all the way back, well, way back before this, but Black Sabbath made it famous with the song Black Sabbath. But anyways. Does that sound evil? Just the way this flatted five changes to a regular power chord, a regular fifth, back, and then he messes with it a little bit over here too. All right, we have to cover the other Jerry Cantrell chord that he pretty much made his own. I did say Kurt Cobain made it famous, but really it was Jerry Cantrell that really put it over the top, and it's this sound here. Okay, in this case, if we're not talking about the detuning aspect, so we have the F sharp seven at 11 chord, and if you just make an F sharp major bar chord and just lift off the high strings, only allowing the fretted fingers to make the uh, the first notes and then letting the open strings of the first and second string finish it off, you get that sound. You could start with a regular bar chord like he does. Release some and you get that sound. So he starts off regular major, lifts off, and then does the same thing at the fifth position, at the fifth fret. So he gets to claim that one as well. Be sure to use some chorus. I'm just using a boss chorus ensemble. It sounds pretty good for Alice in Chains songs. Okay, we can't shut the wah pedal off quite yet, especially if we're gonna add some octaves and really accentuate part of this song. If you just get really good at moving octaves around, that sounds great on its own. I love the sound of octaves and they have a very unique uh, sound to them. Now, if you add some wah, now they have a cutting sound to them. So I'm just opening the wah each time I play the note. Speaking of getting the most out of your bends, you know, we talked about overbending, we talked about doing some artificial harmonics, all sorts of things, but a lot of great guitar players do this. Uh, I learned it from Stevie Ray Vaughan, but I heard Jerry Cantrell do this a lot. And that's where you put your finger across two strings as you bend. In this case, we're going to go second string, third string at the seventh fret. And we're just going to bend them together. We're going to go this direction. Now, later we're going to talk about bending and harmonizing with two different guitars. This is one you could do with one guitar. <laughs> All right, so I always hear this now. But uh, when Jerry Cantrell does it, he just gets a lot of emotion. And there's one time where he does it and he does some staccato picking. It sounds great. Now, if you think about a minor scale, we're gonna have a minor sixth interval uh, inside of there. And what Cantrell does so well is he goes from the fifth interval and he holds out that minor sixth interval and it gives it a new type of dissonance that you don't hear very often. Uh, in Angry Cherry, it goes like this. Just the way the vibrations vibrate against each other, it just makes you feel tense a little bit. And that's what I think the song was meant to do. He also does a little quarter bend on that minor six interval just to give it a little more personality. Hardly noticeable until you sit down and try to make it sound like his. A little bit more life than just hitting it. See the difference? Here's the same concept in a different song.
low, low bends are a staple of Jerry Cantrell, and he uses it great in this song. <laughs> That whole song just has this like, it's like you're walking through mud feeling. Uh, that whole album actually feels like that in a good way. As a guitarist who grew up with guys like John Petrucci and uh, Kirk Hammett and a lot of those players, you're trying to be very accurate when you play. But Cantrell broke the rules a lot and he would just do what I call, I've called a couple techniques um, from other artists this as well. But every one of them have their own way of creating chaos. Sometimes, Jerry will just slide up a couple strings and pick like crazy. Just to create some chaotic sounds because, you know, always playing notes and being proper is kind of boring sometimes. And in the beginning of the Angry Chair solo, he just does this tremolo picking and he bends the highest fret of his guitar uh, and it just makes it sound like it's, it's screaming for help. Okay, it's not exactly like that, but that's the concept. And, uh, you know, you just can't be afraid of breaking your string. So you got to chop away at it, whatever tremolo picking uh, technique you have, and then just bend the string and make your guitar squeal a little bit. I don't know too many guitar players that are brave enough to throw that into one of their solos, but it sure gives it its own personality, doesn't it? I was really studying all the different Alice in Chains tunes. And by the way, he's got his own solo stuff. There's a lot of new Alice in Chains out there that's really good. Uh, let's go back to the album that not a lot of people talk about, but it's their self-titled album. It's kind of a sad album because it's the beginning of the end for Lane Staley, but uh, it really shows in the first tune how good Jerry is at adding an overdubbed guitar part that's melodic, and it really helps it along. Where a lot of guitar players might be just content going like this. <laughs> that feels groovy but it's not as memorable until this part kicks in so if you're a guitar player who writes a lot of rhythm parts see if you could throw a couple of these melodic overdubs into your uh, ideas and then the tricky part is playing them live without maybe having a second guitar player but if you do you got it made otherwise you have to find a way to do it yourself when it comes to lead motifs this is very important Try to develop some that feel really good to you. Jerry loves to do this hammer-on pull-off on two strings idea, and this is very Kirk Hammett as well. I'd mention Kirk Hammett in every video, I think. But if you just go like this, so I'm going E to G to E, down to D and back to E, so it's first, hammer-on pull-off, and then you dip down to the D, come back. I'm going to use distortion and maybe some wah, and I'm just going to keep repeating it. And this is very much what Control does on a lot of solos. All right, it takes a lot of dexterity to keep that going, kind of like the, the wah trill we did earlier. But um, the harder part of this is that you have to use two strings, and you have to find the best way for you to pick it. I'm just doing some sweep across economy picking. Or can you use your pinky? Depending on how strong your pinky is, that takes a lot of work to get your pinky that strong. Uh, also picking, that instead of just doing economy picking, you could do up and down picking, outside picking. That's fine too, or inside picking. Which if you've watched my lessons, you know that I hate inside picking. I always feel like I'm trapped between two strings. So um, yeah, I wouldn't do that. The great part of that kind of boxy motif shape is you could use it in any key. And then you can go down the entire pentatonic scale, the minor pentatonic in this case, and really practice it across all the strings. Or... Then the worst feeling one. That actually sounded kind of sweet. Now, when you think of great legato, you probably think of guys like Steve I, Satriani, all those monsters on guitar, but you might not think of Jerry Cantrell, and he throws some really great legato licks in there once in a while, especially in the song Nutshell, if you listen to that. He surprised me with a lot of flashy lead techniques uh, here and there. <laughs> So 
getting that correct, accurate, and strong could take a while. And then you have it up here. Remember, if your hand feels weak and you can't do legato very well, go to my um, video that says make your left hand a thousand times stronger. I don't know what I called it, but it's in my uh, video library and it goes like this. You just do that one technique for as long as you can until your hand cramps up and then you're able to do these a lot easier. Wah covers up all mistakes. I learned way more than just how to play heavy with Jerry Cantrell, especially in those acoustic albums. If you haven't, like I said before, heard them, uh, they have Sap, which is I think older than Jar of Flies, but Jar of Flies is like the best one in my opinion. Just check it out. He does this really cool technique that I'm sure a lot of you guys know, but he uses it very effectively. It brings his thumb over the top and he plays slash chords. So in this example, <laughs> So I played D and I arpeggiated it. And then I brought my thumb over the top to hit the bass note as F sharp now. So we're changing the bass note. So it becomes D over F sharp. Speaking of pretty sounding things, Jerry Cantrell is a great finger picker. And in this particular song, probably my second favorite song behind Rotten Apple, it's uh, Whale and Wasp, and he takes this G shape and he just moves it around while he finger picks. If you're not familiar with finger picking, I did a lot of videos on those, but we're going to use our thumb on the bass strings and we're gonna use our index, middle, and ring for the rest of them. And watch how we just walk this pattern down chromatically. <laughs> Does that sound great? Who would have thought just moving a shape down chromatically could sound so good? And then he moves it around even more just to show off. So on top of being an amazing rock player and a blues player, because a lot of his solos are bluesy in my opinion, he's also great at finger picking and he creates some really memorable pieces with finger picking. Okay, so this song has a couple of lessons within it. It's the finger picking aspect. It's the moving of the one shape around to get a lot of sounds. But my favorite part is probably the harmonized leads that he does over the top. First of all, the harmony that he does mostly in the song sounds like this. What a sad sound. That kind of sums up my early 20s. Okay, so the other guitar goes. Now you might think you could just play those together and it would sound good, but it's not the same. I'm gonna play them at the same time once and you're gonna hear, here's together on one guitar. It's really hard to measure out a half step bend for both of them. Now, if you do them separately, so you have much more control over the, uh, the release of it so that it can be timed really well. Now my favorite part. Okay, I decided it was smarter to do the rhythm part first and then overdub the leads, so hopefully it all made sense to you. Okay, I think that's a really cool way to end this video. Uh, once again, I want to thank Jerry Cantrell, Allison Shanes, uh, for really helping me through hard times in my life. Uh, this is back when like, you would have your favorite album and it would get you through a really hard period of time. I don't know if people still do that. It's too easy just to hear too many songs and create a playlist or something. But back then it was Jar of Flies was my go-to album. And then of course Dirt. And then I learned to really, really appreciate uh, their first album, Facelift, after quite a bit of time, you know, after Lane passed away, I went back and listened to the whole album and I realized that it's such an epic album. The first four songs are timeless. So go ahead and give uh, that a listen if you haven't already. But I'm, I assume you have if you're watching this video. So thanks everyone. I got to use a new toy, this talk box. I think I'm going to try to implement it into more things, maybe some more recording projects because it's fun. But uh, I don't know. I had a lot of fun doing this video and thanks for watching guys and we'll catch you soon. Thanks. Bye.